Hi, my name is Elmer Fink. I'm a, a emeritus faculty member at Fort Hayes State University, and I'm the uh, associate uh, curator of mammals and birds out here in the Sternberg Museum. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, grassland small mammals uh, in Kansas. Uh, we're going to be trying to talk about what one would see if one went to a typical grassland um, across Kansas. And then um, I want to start out by talking about how we actually find out about these small mammals first and then talk a, a little bit about the, the taxonomy um, and body size of the small mammals that we have. Uh, mention a little bit about foraging and then end it by talking a little bit about response uh, to fire of, of these small mammals because that's one of the practices that we have particularly in the Flint Hills of Kansas and the Red Hills of Kansas. Uh, not so much out here in the Chalk Hills um, in western Kansas, but in other places we have that as a management scheme. Uh, in order to trap small mammals, we use what is called a, a Sherman live trap. Uh, this happens just to be a box sized trap that we can uh, push the door open and put peanut butter in the back door or we can make a peanut butter ball and rolled oats. Uh, we can set the trap then uh, such that the animal walks in there and once it does the door shuts and we have it. Uh, when it's cold outside we put a, a piece of fiber fill or cotton in there uh, to keep the um, animals from touching the aluminum uh, which would be relatively cold, keeps them uh, relatively warm. In the summertime, we don't worry about having that uh, cotton in there. So this is the uh, 13 rodents and two shrews that we uh, typically capture uh, in uh, grasslands of, uh, of Kansas. Most of my work has been done either in the Flint Hills or in uh, Ellis County um, and other areas here in the Chalk Hills of, of, of Kansas. And so we go from a relatively large body-sized animal like this uh, eastern wood rat, uh, which is Neotoma floridana. Uh, it is a woodland species that goes into the grassland. Uh, it will cache food uh, and it will um, uh, spend the winter uh, in its den. Uh, typically only comes out a little bit if it warms up some. Uh, but essentially caches enough food uh, to make it through into the uh, uh, springtime. This thing weighs approximately uh, 435 uh, grams as a maximum or about a maximum, which is about a pound. Uh, so it's the largest uh, small mammal that we actually have in um, uh, the grasslands of Kansas. Um, it is a, uh, from the order Rodentia, as most of these are. Um, we've got uh, two in the order uh, Eulipotyphla, which is uh, the shrews that I'll talk a little bit about later. So it's the largest one that we actually capture. And then the next one that we have is an animal that has moved into Kansas from Mexico uh, over the last seven or eight decades. Um, it is Sigmodon hispidus, the cotton rat. Uh, it weighs uh, approximately uh, 90 to 125 uh, grams, so it is about half or um, two-thirds the size of the wood rat uh, that we actually have, just as a comparison between the two of them. Uh, we also have a 13-line um, ground squirrel um, that we capture in uh, grasslands. This is Ictitomys tridecim lineatus is a species name. Uh, it weighs uh, approximately 125 grams also. Uh, the thing that's different about this particular animal is that this animal is diurnal. All the other animals that I'm going to talk to you about are nocturnal, meaning that they forage over the night. And so one of the things that we would do in order to capture the majority of these uh, array of small mammals is put the trap out before um, sunset, uh, trap through the night, get the animals out uh, first thing in the morning, uh, try to get it out before 10 o'clock so that they don't heat up and those particular kinds of things and then uh, proceed from there. 
We mark those animals in a variety of different ways. Uh, we can toe clip uh, them to, to actually have a, uh, so we can recognize individuals, or we could put an ear tag in. Uh, we also use pit uh, tags that we actually put in either in the back uh, between the ears or in the belly. Um, and we can inject a, a, a needle in there and just like in Walmart, there's a wand that you can put over it and it'll actually read a number, uh, which we um, uh, do sometimes when we're actually doing that. And so what we've gone from is 425 uh, grams to uh, about 125 grams. Then we have a group that is uh, around uh, 18 to uh, um, 30, 40 grams. Uh, we can start out with uh, the white-footed mouse or Paramiscus leucopus is what we uh, call this uh, mouse. It has a relatively long tail um, and relatively large front or hind feet. Uh, and part of the reason um, that it has a large tail and the uh, large feet is that it is actually an animal that spends more time in trees and shrubs than it does on the ground in, in grasslands. And so we can compare that to Paramiscus uh, uh, sonoronensis, the western uh, deer mouse, um, which is a little bit smaller in body size and also has a relatively short tail. Uh, the feet um, are actually a little bit smaller. In Kansas, uh, we can tell these two species apart because Paramiscus leucopus, this white-footed mouse, um, has a 21 millimeter hind foot length. The Paramiscus uh, sonoronensis or the western deer mouse actually has its hind feet less than 20 uh, millimeters. And also, um, uh, which it might be hard to see, um, but the animal on uh, my right here uh, actually has a sharply bicolored tail, um, which is another way that we can actually tell them apart. This one is typically caught more in places where we have shrubs and it may be caught in the woodlands in Kansas, uh, but if there are shrubs out in the grassland, we find this. This one is a, pretty much a grassland obligate. Um, typically, body size is going to change such that um, uh, the body size increases by about 60%, but we have some that are actually relatively similar that do different things, like Onychomys leucogaster, for example. This particular animal has a relatively short tail. Um, it is a grasshopper mouse, and as its name implies, it eats a lot of insects, um, grasshoppers being one of them. One of the neat things about this animal is it'll actually howl like a wolf. The, the sound isn't as, uh, uh, isn't as loud, um, and they don't go in packs or any of the things like wolves do, but uh, you can imagine a, a small little mouse standing on a rock, lifting its head back and actually howling. Uh, and then we have the uh, Ketodipus um, hispidus, um, which is a pocket mouse, and the pocket mouse is more of a dry land uh, uh, species. Uh, even though we can find it in some of the tall grass prairie sites in the eastern part of the state, in areas that are relatively um, dry, like at the at the base of a hill, for example, uh, there will be t uh, places where we have outcroppings of uh, limestone or some other material. Um, that bring in some of the, the grasses that this particular animal uh, enjoys. And again, its body size is around 40 um, grams. And one of the things that it actually has is it has a little pocket on the side, a cheek pouch, that in fact it'll take seeds, put those in its cheek pouch, and take those seeds back to its den or, or its nest and, and actually eat there instead of eating out in the uh, open grassland. Um, and then we have a um, Microtus ochergaster, our a prairie vole, has a relatively short tail. Its body size is anywhere from 30 to 60 grams typically. 
Uh, it's a herbivore, eats mostly uh, grasses uh, and forbs, uh, that is, is, eats the plants themselves, uh, not so much uh, the seeds. Uh, a near relative of it, which we can actually catch in some of the woodlands, is um, a uh, Microtus uh, pinatorum, or the uh, pine vole. Uh, and it's found in the woodlands in Kansas or in uh, woodlands adjacent to grasslands, so we do catch it in grasslands. And one of the things that you can see uh, when you compare these two um, animals is that the one on my right actually has a much longer tail, longer than its hind foot, as compared to the uh, uh, Pinatorum. And there's a slight reddish tinge to the back of the uh, Pinatorum as compared to Microtus, Ochrogaster, or the Prairie Vole. Um, the uh, Pine Vole uh, is actually ca uh, captured in areas that have uh, wet meadow type of, of, of grassland, so we have that uh, particular thing. Um, other wet meadow species, that is species that in fact have um, like areas that are relatively damp in the grassland, um, are like this um, Zapis hudsonicus, which is the meadow jumping mouse. Um, and one of the things that we see with the meadow jumping mouse is a very, very long tail relative to body size. Uh, it is actually a little bit longer than um, its um, tail length. We can actually have some of the Zapis species that the tail length will be twice as long as its body size, so uh, we don't have that uh, one in, in, in our grasslands. And we don't catch a lot of these, um, but only in very damp areas. So a place where the, there might be a seep, for example, where, the, where uh, water comes up to the top surface in the grassland is a place that we will see those. And then we drop down in size going uh, around 10 to, to 15 to 10 grams. And what we see is uh, these little guys, both of which are Rhythrodonomy species. The, the one that I'm holding in my right hand is um, uh, Montanus, uh, uh, the um, prairie um, or plains harvest mouse. The one in my left hand is the um, uh, western uh, harvest mouse, um, also known as Rhythrodonomys uh, megalotus. And one of the things that we see is that, um, that these species um, weigh like 10 grams. 10 grams would be um, a quarter, weighs a gram. So these things weigh about two quarters when you actually uh, stop and, and look at them. And then we, on occasion, get this individual uh, species, which is Mus musculus, which is a house mouse. Uh, this is an introduced species from Europe. And we find it more frequently in places like uh, um, wheat fields um, or agricultural fields. Sometimes uh, if we have uh, homesteads near uh, where we're trapping. So it is a place where, in fact, there's been quite a bit of disturbance of the grassland. This actually is in a different family than uh, all of, most of these are actually in Chrysididae. This one is a murid, which means that it, it is a species that comes from Europe. And then we have two uh, animals that eat insects. Uh, this one is in fact Lorina holophaga, or Elliot's short-tailed shrew. And this one is Cryptotus parva. Uh, very small little shrew. This one weighs uh, anywhere up to 5 grams. This one weighs anywhere from 8 to 12 grams. And uh, the thing that's incredible about these animals is um, uh, this uh, Elliot's short-tailed shrew, for example. It will actually bite an, an organism and it's got a toxic substance, so it's venomous, uh, like, like some snakes are. And uh, the toxic substance causes the animals to actually um, go become comatose. Um, so they can get a larger, this thing could actually eat uh, something like this deer mouse, which is the same body size, so it can actually eat larger uh, kinds of things. It can actually take things that are twice as big uh, as a prairie vole because that toxin knocks it out 
and then the shrew carries it back to its den. Uh, an interesting thing about this is that it will actually uh, eat larvae um, or immature stages of insects um, and sometimes bring those back to its den and uh, the, the uh, toxin doesn't kill the organism so it's not going to decompose but it causes it to be comatose and so sometimes those things start to wake up when they do they're rebitten by this particular species and get it to be comatose again so that it can actually eat at a time that it actually prefers to eat which is uh, a very incredible thing uh, that can actually happen. Now when we talk about these uh, organisms we can also look at them from a perspective of you know how, what are they taxonomically and so we can pull out um, uh, things like this uh, meadow jumping mouse it a is actually in the uh, family Dipodo uh, 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 Dipodonidae um, which is a, uh, a, a species that is more uh, typical of uh, wet areas, uh, a family. Um, the rest of these, except for our 13 line ground squirrel, are in the Chrysididae. The th a 13 line ground squirrel is actually in the squirrel family, the uh, um, Sericidae. And uh, again, this one is nocturnal. Everything else in this uh, collection is. Uh, something that is, um, uh, this one is diurnal, excuse me, uh, everything else is um, nocturnal. This is the only uh, diurnal species. So in the, if we trap in the summertime and we have a lot of 13 line ground squirrels, one of the things that we actually have to do with our traps is that when we get done checking them, we actually um, shut them so that in fact they're not open during the heat of the day because this animal will die during the heat of the day in an aluminum trap. We have to come back out uh, a, a two or three hours before sunset, shut the traps and then have a low likelihood of actually capturing these. Because in our population studies what we want to try to do is we want to try um, to find out how the animals respond to a variety of management schemes. Um, and vegetation type and other types of things we need to have the animals alive and so one of the things that we try to do is we try to uh, uh, enhance uh, their survival as long as we can make sure our trapping is not actually causing death in them. Now one of the things that's very interesting to me um, and something that we really had a hard time trying to understand when I was working on Kanza Prairie is we would go out into the field um, and this is a big blue stem that we actually have. The, seed, the seeds are off because this is from last year um, and this particular um, big blue stem uh, is eaten by uh, several of these um, species. Well you can imagine if you take this big blue stem um, and you have a uh, Rhythrodonomies megalotus that can actually climb up this stem with no problem, can come to the top and actually eat the seed heads and this will bend very lightly. So that's you know sort of its strategy, it can actually go up and actually eat the seeds um, as they're maturing uh, or after they've matured on the seed head. Now obviously if the seeds fall off like they will over the course of winter it would be down below the plant. Now imagine this thing is weighing approximately 12 grams, 12 to 15 grams. Now imagine taking this thing which weighs 125 grams or so and it's going to walk up this stem and what do you think happens? Well it's going to bend over. So this is going to fall and if you hang on you have the hot possibility of you being near the seed head or you're back here further and it bends and this falls so these seeds are now over here in the grassland and you've got to find them. So what do you want to do? Well if you want to get to the top and you can't climb it one of the things you could do is cut it. So we're going to go down to the base and we're just going to cut that big blue stem 
and so it falls over. Now where are the seeds in relation to you? Well, they're, you know, three feet away. And finding them in the litter layer of the grassland is going to be relatively difficult. So what we find that this Sigmodon hispidus, this cotton rat actually does, is it cuts this stem in short little pieces that are about this big, which actually fit in the mouth of this animal. And so what it does is it actually holds on to that stem, cuts off a little piece, and then slides it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, break a little piece off, move up the stem on the ground as you're holding it, and keep on doing that. And you've got a nice neat pile of these things underneath you. And we then eventually get to where the seeds are because the seeds now have been brought to you. You didn't have to go out and try to find it in some particular place. And we, when we first saw that, uh, my advisor for my postdoc told me that I was crazy. Uh, there's no way they could be doing that. So we actually brought some in the lab, put some uh, big blue stem stems up, and then recorded them actually breaking them off just the way I had suggested. The reason that I thought it was Sigmodon is we measured the breath across its mouth, you know, just measure that part that I'm having right now. Did that to a variety of different species, and this is the only species that actually fit that particular category. So another thing that we can think about is um, we're going to be doing a variety of different uh, human practices on grasslands. We add cattle to grasslands, for example. And so one of the things that we could actually look at is the effect of uh, grazing on the small mammals and their distribution. The other thing that we uh, frequently do in the prairie is to uh, continue to have grasslands. So what we're going to do is try to um, keep woodland species out and invigorate the grasslands. So in order to do that, we typically burn. And one of the things that we do in uh, at least the Flint Hills of Kansas and the Red Hills of Kansas, a little bit in the Smoky Hills, uh, and some out here in western Kansas, is we actually uh, burn the prairie. And so one of the things that we want to find out is how do these small mammals respond to prairie fire? And that was a question that we asked while I was a postdoc um, at uh, Kansas State University. And what we found out was that there are three different responses, population responses, that you can have. Uh, populations can either increase because of the spring fire, populations could decrease because of the spring fire, or populations might not change because of the spring fire. And so what we find is those populations that increase, we call fire positive populations. Those populations that decrease, we call fire negative populations. And those populations that don't change, we just call fire neutral populations. The incredible thing about that is I went to an international uh, uh, fire conference where we talked about responses of small mammals um, to fire. The people in Britain and in Australia do just the opposite. So increasing was a fire negative species. <laughs> decreasing was a fire positive species. And you can imagine how hard that was for those of us from North America to actually think about uh, the different responses. What we were doing is we thought fire as a, a, a positive influence to increase populations. And they thought of fire as a negative influence to decrease populations, which is uh, sort of incredible, but um, we, we worked it out over the course of the three days that we were there. And so we can take a look at some of those of our species, and we can see that a Paramiscus um, a sonorinensis, the western um, deer mouse, is a fire positive species. And we can look at its natural history, and we can see that, in fact, it typically nests underground. Um, usually in, in small little 
um, tunnels and holes, not very deep, uh, but de uh, deep enough so that when the fire goes over the top of the vegetation and burns the area, then in fact uh, they um, survive. So, that, so things are working real well. Remember we're doing this typically in April and May, and it's about the time period that um, all of these small mammals are reproducing for the first time in the se new season. And they will reproduce several times after that. The other thing is it eats a lot of seeds. And what we find is that it is a uh, species, you know, the seeds that are actually there are more visible because, in fact, um, the litter layer has been removed. So it's more open. And we have more insects that, that actually come. There's a variety of insects that are, can actually be eaten. So we have a, a fire positive species. Some species, like the prairie vole here, are fire negative. And part of the reason for that is they actually build their nests in the litter layer itself. And because they build their nests in the litter layer, um, they're young and um, themselves also might actually um, succumb to the fire. We've seen these things run, they actually have runways, so they have small patches that are about twice their body size where they actually clip all the vegetation and make little highways in the, in the prairie. And we've seen them actually leaving the fire, going to the edge of a ravine and going down so then the fire comes and jumps right over them and they, they survive well, but their nest is not. And so one of the things that we actually see is that this species is a fire negative species. Some species like our uh, Elliot short tail shrew um, seems to have a mixed response. There's no change uh, in the population uh, relative to uh, the fire. And so this is a, uh, one of the fire neutral species. We find that our um, um, our hispid pocket mouse is uh, actually uh, a species that is fire positive, but remember it's in that dry areas that we actually have that are at the lower part of hills that don't have, you know, they have usually C3 grasses and not C4 grasses. And it's one of these species that, you know, nests also underground, and that's where it actually has its. Um, seeds that it actually has, which is, a, again, a, a, a good reason to have a fire positive species. We, we also know um, from studying small mammals that some of them do some interesting things. We can look at uh, this large uh, eastern wood rat, and one of the things it does is it caches seeds. Now, if it is caching a seed, in its uh, nest area, what they do is they build um, dens um, that are made of sticks. And a lot of people call these pack rats because they will build these, um, collect everything. I lost a pen one time on Kanza Prairie and found it in a wood rat nest that was subsequently burnt. So um, kind of interesting. Found my pen, figured it was something to show off to the females or something uh, relative to um, getting to breed or whatever. But one of the nice things that we f see in this uh, particular species is that the seeds themselves are in relatively moist areas uh, underneath their nests. And that the nests that they actually have, uh, we, I call them dens, uh, some people call them wood rat houses, um, actually have a relatively high humidity, which causes the seeds to get fungus on it. And so that fungus will actually make the seeds inedible to most species, but this thing actually licks the fungus off of the seeds and then preserves the seeds for future year use. Also had a student look at the temperature inside of one of these wood rat houses, uh, looking at the, for her master's thesis. And what she found was that the house was cooler inside in the winter, I mean in the summer, and warmer inside in the winter. And when you look at the structure of the house, 
what they did is they would l let the house sort of fall apart and not have it as compact with the um, the limbs and, and other woody vegetation that they actually have and then they would make it compact again as they went into winter. So that's a, a, a short synopsis of uh, some of the small mammals that you can see in the grasslands of Kansas and I uh, would like to have you uh, come back to visit us again in a new way to museum. Thanks for joining us in a new way to museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.